Hello, everyone, and welcome to another dated conversation. The health crisis in WHW is sure all the resources of health personnel. Another element of thinking outside the box, trying to come up with ways of moving. Let's try to keep these numbers from doubling. First, I want to say thank you for inviting me to the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Community Conversations right here on Facebook Live. And today is our final live community conversation for 2020. Next, uh, next week, we'll have some other programming for you, but we'll be back live again in the new year. And I hope everyone is going to have a happy and safe holiday. For, for our end of the year show, we wanted to, to talk a little bit about, uh, we'd make it fun, and we do maybe the top five accomplishments of, uh, of 2020, and we've got some great guests uh, to talk about all those. But before we get started, uh, by way of announcements, I wanted to talk about uh, one piece of legislation that was passed this past week by uh, Harrisburg City Council, which hasn't really uh, gained enough attention, uh, I'm afraid, and that is the eviction moratorium that we've put in place for the city of Harrisburg. Uh, calls have started to come in. There was a little bit of coverage uh, in the Berg, but not as much in the wider media. Uh, and it's a very important piece of legislation because it is basically outlawing evictions uh, in the city of Harrisburg at the same time that uh, the federal government really has refused to act on, on that issue. One question that we're, we, we've gotten from people is how can, how can a city overrule uh, federal law? And the answer is we're not overruling federal law because there is no federal law um, that is, uh, is governing this issue. Uh, we've had to put these safeguards in place in Harrisburg to protect our residents. What it means is uh, that uh, there cannot be an eviction at this very moment as COVID is spiking, as the temperatures are going down, and as our, our homelessness population is already in crisis in the city of Harrisburg. Um, it lasts for 30 days, but it can be renewed in 30-day intervals, and it's basically uh, going to last while we are in this um, emergency period uh, of the winter. It does not wipe away rent. I need to be very clear on that. Um, there, if you owe an obligation to a landlord, you still will owe an obligation to a landlord, although the city does have a rental relief program and some other things that we've talked about if you need assistance. But what it does do, it says you can't be thrown out on the street. And we think that's the, uh, the obviously the right thing to do, and that landlords are going to need to be patient patient uh, as we continue to uh, try and make it to the other side of this, uh, this epidemic. Um, the Magisterial District Justices have all been informed. Uh, there should be a, a, um, a moratorium on processing of, of, of evictions, and, uh, uh, and we should be in sync with the county court system. If people have questions, they are welcome to direct them to the city. Uh, if you're watching and have a question, if it's of a non-emergency nature, we are encouraging everyone simply to call 311, um, uh, uh, state their question clearly, and we will get back to you if we don't have an immediate answer on the spot. If you have concerns about um, an address or a property, uh, and uh, it's also of a non-emergency nature, you can uh, send those via 311, and our codes inspectors or others will, uh, will look into it. If it's an emergency situation, let's say you are being evicted and uh, you know that you shouldn't be, uh, you can uh, call 911, consider that an emergency, and the police will be dispatched. Police, codes, fire, building and housing, city personnel will have the ability to uh, cite the landlord and, um, and hopefully intervene in a way which uh, protects your rights. So uh, that's, uh, that's the status. Again, if it's uh, not of an emergency nature and just questions, call 311. If it's uh, um, an, an emergency and, and happening in the, in the spot, call 911. And uh, it'll be a combined effort by all of our uh, public safety and building and housing folks to, uh, to try and address this. It's an important piece of legislation. I think we're leading the way here in, um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, for sure, and uh, it's very much needed. It's very much needed in part, and I think it's a good transition here, moment into our, our first graph, the BioBot data, so that people understand just where we are. Um, if you look at the BioBot graph for this week, you will see it is continuing to go uh, up and up. It looks like there's um, a bit of a, a decline, but that's actually the normalized 
virus concentration level. Um, and it is, it is way, it, it is, it is, it is, it is extremely high. Um, the best way to, to show it in context is to look at the, the graphs on the next page. If we do that, you'll see that, um, uh, and, and look at the, uh, the line graph there at the, at the bottom, you'll see that Harrisburg is representing the red to the far right. Our sample has a higher concentration level than 92% of all the other, uh, you know, samples in, uh, in the country, which is collected by this company. And if you look at the, um, the sort of dot uh, splatter graph at the top, you'll see that we are, we are sort of off the charts in terms of, of concentration. We're looking at an estimate in the Harrisburg metropolitan area of 270 new cases of COVID a day. That's a, that's a, that's a high incidence rate. It's a, it's a lot. It means that we're right in the midst of, of a very, very difficult period. So the response is continue to do what we're doing in the sense of social distancing, wearing masks, taking things seriously, um, staying uh, away from confined indoor spaces, teleworking as much as possible. Um, and hopefully we get soon to a vaccine distribution uh, to warmer temperatures and to the spring. But we can't, uh, we can't be evicting people in the midst of the, the worst moment of this crisis, and we're going to you know, we're gonna have to all work together, landlords, tenants, uh, all of us here in the city, to uh, ensure the, the greater public safety and the greater public good. Um, on a lighter note and a brighter note, it is holiday season, and uh, I'm hoping everyone's going to have a safe uh, holiday. I know I'm going to be home this holiday with uh, with my immediate family, and and uh, we're going to be, um, uh, you know, like like many, uh, avoiding uh, extensive traveling. Um, and I'm encouraging folks to um, to consider for New Year's Eve joining our virtual celebration online. That's right, we're having a virtual New Year's Eve celebration. It'll have some neat highlights and community photos and messages, and we will have a countdown. It features uh, Harrisburg locations and uh, all sorts of fun things. So tune into Facebook, um, and, uh, and, or, and you can go uh, to, or to the city website, harrisburgpa.gov, on New Year's Eve night and join us with the countdown. It's not going to be the same as gathering together in, uh, in, in downtown and watching the strawberry drop, but it'll be, it'll be fun. And, uh, and I think we'll all be glad to, to ring in the new year and uh, leave 2020 behind. Also, I mentioned this uh, last week, but we have um, uh, 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 some suggestions and ideas for how you can have a countdown to Kid Night celebration at home. Uh, you can have a, a do-it-yourself balloon drop. Um, we have party hat templates. We've got fun stuff. Look at all that stuff on the website. So check it out, harrisburgpa.gov slash NYE for New Year's Eve. And um, we want everybody to have a, a fun uh, family-centered time. Also, uh, for New Year's Eve, consider sharing your photos and your memories with us on social media, media using the hashtag NYEHBG. Hashtag NYEHBG, and uh, we will um, we will share in in the celebrations with you. All right. By way of a wrap up show for 2020, um, thought we would highlight uh, five five accomplishments. We won't necessarily say these are the the only accomplishments. There have been a lot of accomplishments. We just passed a, a budget um, uh, very very successfully here. We extended the city's uh, taxing authority. We've been um, growing the city workforce and. I've been doing a lot of things, but these were five that uh, that, that that I thought uh, bore additional review at the end of the year and a little bit of uh, focus. And let's make it fun. Let's make it an actual countdown. So coming in at number five and representing um, uh, our city engineering department is Wayne Martin for Vision Zero. Congratulations, Wayne. Um, this uh, this is exciting. Um, uh, Vision Zero is, uh, is, is a planning strategy. It's near and dear to, to my heart. But why don't, you, why don't you remind folks a little bit about what Vision Zero is and um, you know, what, we've, uh, what we've accomplished so far um, uh, since, uh, since we began here a couple of years ago. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Wayne Martin. And hang on, hang on Wayne. I think, I think we, we need, need to get, to get, you, get off you off mute. mute. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, no, no. All right. All right. Never mind, Never mind Wayne. Wayne. Keep going. Keep going. It's thank, me. Thank it's me. you, Mayor. Um, Wayne Martin, city engineer. Um, yeah, Vision Zero is the city's commitment to eliminate um, injuries and fatalities as a result as a result of uh, vehicles, um, automotive, you know, uh, 
uh, by 2030. And so this was adopted a little over two years ago. Uh, and since then, uh, we have had a result in, in fatalities. Um, I am going to share a PennDOT uh, data for 2019. Uh, hopefully you can see that this is available to the public. It's on the uh, Pennsylvania Crash Information Tool and it's through December of 2019. So it we don't have the 2020 data yet. That'll become available uh, June of 2021. It takes about six months to compile the data. Um, but you can see uh, in 2018, late 2018 is when the uh, Vision Zero uh, commitment was adopted, uh, made by the, by the city. And in the following year, uh, fatalities went down, you know, from 10 to two. Uh, serious injuries uh, actually went up a bit uh, by two, uh, but those are the two uh, categories where mo the Vision Zero uh, commitment is most, you know, is focused upon. The way we do that is a very data-driven approach. We have a high injury network, so we focus on, on those uh, streets that make up you know, our high injury network. Uh, we also look at our most vulnerable road users, which are pedestrians, bicyclists, motorcyclists. And we focus on improvements um, you know, to reduce uh, the, those conflicts. So um, you know, we're, we're proud of this, but uh, still a long way to go. Um, like I said, you know, so I guess if you compare it to like losing weight or something, you know, the first 10 pounds are always the easiest. And now we're, and now we have a lot of work to do uh, to, to, you know, to reduce these two numbers here, two and 27 down to zero. We have to get it done by 2030. That's the commitment. Well, th thanks, Wayne. Obviously, we're right in the uh, the early stages of this. It's a commitment that uh, that we take seriously and that uh, we've made as a as a city. I think, though we're in the early stages, if people look around Harrisburg, they're already starting to see um, uh, uh, some of these projects come to fruition. So, can you talk about uh, what people see right now? We'll talk about um, future projects that are planned, but right now, what have we accomplished um, under this Vision Zero rubric? So for this year, I have some uh, photos I'm sharing now that are a few projects that we've completed this year. Uh, this here it, are the lights that were installed just a few months ago along Market Street. Uh, this incre increases obviously the uh, illumination, uh, you know, to, to enable safe travels. This is between Front and Market Street along our high injury network. This is the same uh, lighting <clears throat> that we installed on State Street, uh, which is, you know, our most um, critical roadway. So uh, we took serve, public surveys and polls and actually did lighting studies on State Street and found that the, uh, the roadway didn't, you know, wasn't properly illuminated in accordance with, um, you know, latest standards. Um, so these, these light heads are all new. We actually rotated those 90 degrees um, to help illuminate the roadway and we installed overhead lights on the um, traffic signals to better illuminate those crosswalks. In addition to lighting um, upgrades, you'll see at Market Square, there's some ADA improvements uh, occurring now. The city's a, a delighted to be a partner with CAT and PennDOT on the improvements to that. There's another photograph from Market Square. Again, it's uh, to eliminate the possibility of a pedestrian, especially those in, in a wheelchair or what have you, having to um, enter into a lane of travel. You know, they have a safe place to, to, to walk and negotiate. Uh, here's a project in uh, Market in Dewberry that was completed earlier this year, which is a, a raised intersection. Uh, this is right in front of Strawberry Square. There was a lot of pedestrian activity crossing Market Street at that location. Uh, so, you know, one of the Vision Zero uh, ideas behind Vision Zero is let's study what people are doing and people were crossing there. And so let's make it safer for them across. Let's, you know, let's paint it, let's raise it so that vehicles must slow down, acknowledge the, the issue that it's, you know, people are still going to cross. It's just let's make it safer for them to do so. Um, here's, a, here's a project on Dairy Street that we are uh, working with Capital Region Water on. Uh, new sidewalks and um, 
you know, ADA ramps along Dairy Street. This is as near 14th Street. Um, Capital Region Water obviously benefits from the infrastructure that's being installed, the uh, green infrastructure. That also will help with like flooding, uh, localized flooding, uh, which can, you know, can have safety benefits as well when we can get that uh, water off the roadway quicker. Uh, here's a road diet that was done on 6th Street. Uh, this is a traditional uh, four lane to three lane road diet where we added um, bike facilities. So this actually reduces conflict points. It's a known safety strategy endorsed by the Federal Highway Administration for roadways under a certain uh, average daily traffic flow. So this was a good uh, use of that standardized um, you know, road, road diet approach. Um, been, this one in particular has been um, very popular actually. Uh, here's one at um, 4th and Market. We redid the intersection. I'm sorry, 4th and McClay. Uh, we rebuilt the intersection. So some of the safety improvements, obviously I mentioned the ADA ramps and the high visibility crosswalks. We also put reflective back plates on the signals and that's been, we've been doing that throughout the city. Uh, improved the visibility of the signals to a, um, you know, 12, eight inch to 12 inch head. So they're easier to see uh, on Forrester street, which I don't have a photo, but if you've traveled the Forrester street corridor, we, we actually use a programmable head um, for the signal, which is another safety uh, strategy so that uh, drivers approaching that um, are not distracted when, you know, there's signals all along the Forrester street corridor uh, and you can basically see every signal head from, you know, the bridge or, or, or up at 7th. And so the, the strategy there is to only allow a driver to see the signal, the lights of the head that they're, they're approaching and, and not, you know, all of them are, um, you know, the statistics um, and, and some of the uh, interviews of, of, of drivers and things, uh, seem to indicate that people were looking at the wrong um, signal head uh, and, 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 and drove through a red light. So those are uh, some of the projects that have been completed this year. Uh, yeah, yeah, those, no, are, those great, are great photos, Wayne. Thanks for, thanks for sharing them. And as you can see, there are projects happening all over, all over the city. Uh, one of the most visible projects uh, completed really prior to this year, but now we've had a whole year of, I guess, w worth of data, was the uh, pretty transformative uh, reworking of, of Third Street. Uh, and uh, that was done, of course, in partnership with uh, Capital Region Water. But we, we put in a lot of bump outs and a lot of new safety features. And I guess my question for you is, um, is Third Street safer? And what, uh, what, uh, what are your reflections after, after people have now started to get used to that new design? So um, I guess it's a little bit anecdotal, but I, you know, I do think um, you know, vehicles are, tri uh, are, are traveling the corridor safer. Um, we do intend to study speeds on Third Street uh, to, to, you know, see that they're within the um, 25 mile an hour limit or, you know, within five miles an hour of the uh, 20, 25 mile an hour limit. That's the 85th percentile speeds. Um, next year, or well, in June, when we have the new data for uh, 2020, that'll, you know, that'll be the tell, right? So we only have sort of a partial year data um, because we're always six months behind in collecting data. Um, so really the tell will be um, uh, the, in June of 20, you know, 2021, when we, when we get the 2020 data and uh, look at the comparisons of the previous years. Uh, sure. How about, how about Street, Wayne? I know you can talk a little bit about that. There's another example. Uh, now the data is in on Front Street. We, of course, took that down from uh, three lanes to two. Um, is that street safer? Is, right. That's that's the perfect example. Uh, the, the the road diet on Front Street um, between Division and and uh, Her Street actually it doesn't go all the way to, to Forrester. Um, it is statistically uh, much safer. Is it perfect? No, no. no. There still have been um, you know situations there. Uh, there have not been fatalities. Um, but you know there have still been incidents but the, statistically it's it's dramatically safer than it was um you know when it was a a, a three-lane roadway coming down there and and 
what's even more interesting, I think, is that the travel times have actually decreased, right? So that's one of the um, uh, complaints about some of these approaches, uh, like like the Sixth Street corridor, for example, right? We we reduce the amount of lanes that a vehicle can travel in, and so there's a there's a misconception that that's always going to lead to delays in travel times, but that's not always the case. So like on Front Street, it's actually uh, for whatever reason, um, the travel times have been reduced. And on a sixth street, uh, other studies have shown that that traditional four to three uh, road diet, you know, what, what it does is it, it turning vehicles then enter that center lane and are not delaying the traffic behind them. So, uh, you know, in some cases, um, the travel time actually improves. Yeah, thanks for thanks for that. Well, you know, so 2021 though is really going to be a big year for Vision Zero. We um, we have all of these projects uh, sort of coming to fruition, and in the budget presentation, we gave a, a sort of uh, season by season schedule of everything that was uh, was going to be occurring. Um, but let's talk about some of the highlights for 2021 again. And I, I want to begin with State Street because that has uh, historically by the data. And by the way, people can find the high injury network and um, can can find a lot of information about Vision Zero at the Vision Zero website. Moment, that's the Vision Zero HBG, and you can you could bring that one up. But Wayne, tell us tell us about State Street. What are people going to see? When are they going to see it? So State Street is in the uh, design phase right now. We're happy to report that um, PennDOT. It's a state route, so PennDOT is not only uh, working with us on the design, they're actually funding you know, $500,000 of the project. Uh, so they're also gonna deliver the project. So you know, a lot of, with the city projects, we use uh, various means to uh, pay, what we call paper let, uh, pen bid and other um, online um, delivery mechanisms for delivering um, public works projects. PennDOT has their own mechanism, which is the ECMS system. So PennDOT's going to do that for us. That's going to cut down on the amount of, um, you know, administrative work that the city has to do. So that, that's also a big deal. Um, we have submitted our designs to PennDOT for review. Uh, that happened last week. Uh, they've already came back with some comments, you know, just um, needing more information about right-of-ways and things like that, that a contractor will need to know. But um, the proposal for State Street is, is, a, is another road diet, right? So we have a, um, a five-lane highway out there now. Um, it will function uh, as a five-lane highway during um, peak hours. So uh, during the peak hours, we will have parking restrictions on the direction of travel. So, you know, AM would be coming into the city, PM would be coming out, out of the city. So there'd be some um, restrictions on parking. So if you um, envision uh, bike lanes on the outside, uh, a, a curb um, parking, and then your travel lanes and the travel lanes will be reduced from the 12, uh, 12 foot line, 12 foot wide lanes that they are today to 11 foot, uh, which does have a traffic calming effect. So um, real excited about this uh, project. This is an interim project, not a, not, not a final you know, project. So if, if uh, people seem underwhelmed with the, uh, um, the amount of investment, right? It's, uh, we're looking at a fast implementation, study the effects and then uh, look towards funding, uh, you know, final improvements, but there are so many, um, you know, safety concerns on State Street that this is the fastest way we can move forward with, uh, you know, the improvement, sure, sure. safety improvements. Yeah, and by that I think you just mean that we're using a lot of paint and uh, uh, and we're sort of sketching things out, and then, and that can be adjusted with permanent uh, you know curb cuts or permanent uh, pedestrian islands or permanent things at at a later point, but um, you got to start somewhere, and this should make a big difference. And frankly, um, uh, you know I, I'm excited about the bike lanes, but uh, I, I know they they get they get a bad rap sometimes in in the community. People say, you know, why why are you doing this? But 
part part of the purpose of the bike lane is simply uh, to uh, to give that road the diet and to use up some of that extra space uh, to share it uh, beyond just uh, vehicles. And uh, the bike lanes here serve the purpose of sort of um, of literally shrinking the road. And then they have the added benefit of allowing people to travel with bike. And frankly, in a city where we're constantly anxious about everything having to do with parking and 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 cars, um, we do want to encourage people to um, use alternate means of transportation whenever we can. Um, we don't have a bike lane planned for, uh, plan for Second Street uh, after much uh, conversation about the design there. But let's let's go to that project because uh, that is one that will also be underway in 2021. Won't be completed in 2021, but we will see the street go two ways in, in 2021. So what, what will people um, expect there? And can you uh, remind folks with just a, a brief overview of um, what's going to be happening on North Second Street? Thank you. So uh, that project is currently out for bid. Uh, the proposal, um, I mean, I mean, the project, the plans are to convert to two way. So you'll have one one lane in each direction. You will have a, a turning areas for some of the uh, major, you know, major intersections such as McClay and and and, and the um, you know Forester Division. You will also see <clears throat> some traffic signals, <clears throat> excuse me, being replaced with mini roundabouts. <clears throat> so those will occur on uh, Verbeck, Riley, uh, and Kelker. Uh, there'll be raised crosswalks to go along with those mini roundabouts to further slow traffic. Um, in addition, you'll see there are speed cushions, which are similar to uh, you know, raised crosswalks, uh, although they allow larger vehicles like a fire truck or a trash truck to actually straddle uh, <clears throat> that speed cushion. Uh, there's also a raised intersection at 2nd and Radnor, um, 100, approximately 150 uh, new ADA ramps. Um, it's a very, you know, very large project, the biggest uh, project that uh, the city will have let, it, you know, at least in the past five years. Um, uh, we're you know we're real excited about it. It's a very transformative project. The cities, um, Lancaster, others that have undergone this um, you know one way to two way conversion, um, you know continue to brag about the uh, livability impacts of of such conversions. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. In addition to the to the safety benefits, it's about uh, you know sort of reuniting neighborhoods that have been cut through um, by uh, by traffic. Um, and uh, by by slowing things down, you you definitely you create a more livable city, a more walkable city, um, and a more desirable city. So that's all we have time for today to to, to do for Vision Zero, Wayne. But again, I'm going to refer folks to the Vision Zero HBG.com website, which Moment has up on the screen, and uh, uh, tell people there's a lot more to come. This truly is a transformative vision for the city of Harrisburg, um, and we're going to see a lot of uh, exciting projects in 2021. So th thank thanks for joining us, Wayne. Uh, uh, that was that number was number five. five. Moment and number four is communications and uh i want to give you a a, a, a bit of uh, a shout out here at, at the end of the year because I, i'm not sure people realize just just how much we've had to transform our, our communications here at the city given the the pandemic uh, we've done a tremendous number of things that uh, we'll we'll talk about here in a second but um one of the one of the things that we committed to doing right early on was this very show and uh, uh, we've done this every week since uh, since March. We've done it live, and um, maybe you could take people a little bit behind the scenes uh, and and start with uh, community conversations, uh, because uh, although it may appear seamless on their end, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, broadcasting and doing this live on multiple platforms. So, uh, Moment, how 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 has it been from your perspective um, all these many weeks? Sure. Well, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss. Um the show and, and the yeah. communications in general. Obviously, it all comes down to teamwork. Uh, you know, it's not one person, but uh, you know, the communications bureau, mayor's office, all the departments. Uh, you know, making sure that we have the latest information. So we do appreciate all that collaboration. Um, basically, we have uh, three or four cameras on the set, on the set here, and uh, you know, we just lock those down to kind of minimize the amount of people that are in the studio. So really, it's just uh, you and me uh, nowadays in the studio. Uh, we started out early on where we were bringing in guests, but as the pandemic started to get worse and we got new information from the state and, and, and beyond, 
uh, we, we're seeing how can we minimize the people uh, mm -hmm. in the studio. So obviously we're way more than six feet apart, so we mm -hmm. were able to do that. We have one person in the control room, Asher, who's been doing a great job. You know, he's switching the cameras, monitoring the audio levels, and monitoring the Zoom uh, session as well, making sure that we all can hear and see each other um, you know, throughout the show. Uh, as far as the platforms that we're airing on, this is obviously a lot of our viewers are watching via Facebook Live. Uh, and then it's also uh, simulcast on Channel 20. For those that may not have internet access, uh, they can watch it on there, Comcast Channel 20, WHBG. And then afterwards, it is uploaded to our YouTube page, WHBG 20, and then as a podcast on our SoundCloud. So it's on all those uh, various mediums uh, so that we can make sure to get the information out to as many people as possible. Yeah, and uh, as today with all the guests um, at uh, you know zooming in from from various um, points in the city, it's it's a lot to manage and organize. You've done a, a, a really a tremendous tremendous job. Let's also talk another another thing that grew out of the pandemic, which has been a really um, I think beneficial uh, partnership, has been uh, the partnership that we forged with the Harrisburg School District, um, and in an effort to assist them in their remote learning by allowing them to use Channel 20 for instruction. You want to talk a little bit about uh, about that and what it's meant? Mm -hmm. Sure. So for a good portion of the year, we were uh, broadcasting. Uh, r remote learning on Channel 20 as well. So they have a, a, a great staff there that is uh, a great team that's working uh, and, and, and we're doing basically online learning, remote learning people could watch via, I believe it was YouTube. And we were able to simulcast that on uh, Channel 20 as well. And through our uh, live simulcast on our website, whbg.tv. Uh, and uh, students were able to, th students throughout the city were able to use that as well. You know, maybe those who may not have internet access, they were able to watch on our broadcast. And uh, I believe that was eight to four or so, something like that, Monday to Friday, um, you know, as a service to them, yeah. Yeah, and we, we did a lot of, uh, one of the, our most frequent guests over the past year has been uh, Superintendent Selmer, and uh, we, we've been able to um, help uh, work with them to disseminate information in new ways. I think that's been a, a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a time before we even knew about Zoom. Maybe you knew about Zoom, uh, but uh, I, I didn't. And we had to take uh, basically public meetings, which were um, uh, you know, the only way we had ever done this, and go 100% virtual. And I remember the initial conversations with city council and um, the you know, testing of different platforms, and a lot of thought went in to do this. It seems almost old hat now, but talk, talk a little bit about um, the, 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 um, the, the broadcasting of, of live meetings. Sure, sure. And I, I think before we officially moved to Zoom, um, not many of us had used it before. I think I w was fam a bit familiar um, just kind of talking with family and different things on Zoom. But when it was selected that, okay, Zoom is the platform we're going to go to, we had to first train ourselves and then also um, provide tutorials throughout uh, the city. Um, so we, we arranged for tutorials with um, basically a, t a tour of the, of the platform with city council and the di different departments, different department heads, uh, so that everybody was comfortable as we uh, moved to, uh, you know, have city council meetings live. Uh, so live streamed and then also on Zoom. So as far as the streaming of that, it was it's it was decided, okay, let's let's take it to YouTube. And then that way afterwards it's already on YouTube just like our other council meetings. And um, people can easily just click on that as a recording instead of having to wait for that recording um, afterwards. That was actually one of the benefits of Zoom that we realized that um, beforehand after we would broadcast a city council meeting live, it would maybe take a day or two before we could get it to YouTube because it was a lot of processing of that file. But this allowed us to really take a meeting that was already being streamed to YouTube and then it's there seconds after, actually not even seconds, it's already there uh, after that live session so people can click on it and, and see it in its entirety. Um, but yeah, we, we've, been, we've been able to do that. And then obviously rebroadcasting on Channel 20 as well so that people have that option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and some of the aspects of the meetings are things that uh, you don't control. For instance, uh, you know, council has its own policy on how they want to handle uh, public comment. They don't want to have uh, people do it directly. They've wanted it submitted to um, a public comment email, which you, you set up for them. That's their call. 
Um, but you know, it could be done differently. And uh, and uh, we've we've tried at least through this show and other things to really encourage um, dialogue and engage with people. And um, I think I think just the the very fact that we've been able to successfully have so many meetings and uh, at least make them successful uh, online has been has been tremendous. A lot of work. Another another thing is we've had so much information that we've had to convey to the public. Uh, it's uh, you know it's it's almost breaking news every day with regard to coronavirus and and certainly with other things going on in the city. I know you've uh, you've spent a lot of time uh, sort of updating the website, creating um, a sort of central clearinghouse for information, and maybe you can pull that up and talk a little bit about um, how you've used the website. Sure. And like I mentioned before, it's in collaboration, in conjunction with a lot of different departments and an IT department. I want to give them a shout out to Evan uh, built this page for us here at Harrisburg, pa.gov slash coronavirus is uh, it's an easy link from the home page and we can show that on the screen here uh, on, on the home page. It's right here, the, the link for that. And then this is the actual page. So this has been updated uh, pretty regularly throughout the year. And we have helpful links here. It's a kind of a, we try to make it a one-stop shop so that people can uh, see the, the PA Department of Health, the frequently asked questions, uh, business resources as well. And uh, you know, those are our top, uh, you know, top questions that we get. So we put those right at the top of the screen. Plus the, the updated building hours, treasury hours, the Dropbox that is available uh, behind the building, and the latest tweets from the PA Health Department and the CDC, uh, at, at CDC Gov as well. So people can easily scroll through and, and see uh, the latest guidelines and uh, guidance from uh, those two entities. The BioBout data that we always start the show with, mm -hmm. this is also available here if people wanted to see a, a closer look. And they can also see the full report. Uh, featured content, we have the link to the show and uh, the podcast and then link to the uh, state's uh, press conferences uh, also so that people can see see that and you know they don't have to, to look at the look for it at the state website so they can find it all here at harrisburgpa.gov slash coronavirus and then obviously we have some archived uh, announcements and that includes the declaration of the disaster emergency and, and other news uh, as it happened. Wow, that's just a tremendous amount of information. It's all in one place. It's easy to find. I, I know the website in general sometimes can be difficult to navigate because there's so much and so many different reasons that people go to the website. Uh, and that's been undergoing some new redesigns and their plans for the future. But the way you've streamlined access to the information surrounding uh, coronavirus has been, has been great and really appreciated. And uh, I just want to say personally, it's been uh, it's been very dedicated to be able to work with you on a weekly basis to do uh, to the, do these shows, and it's been uh, it, it, it's, it's greatly appreciated on my end, and certainly worthy of being one of the great accomplishments of uh, of 2020. Right. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to number three on the list, and number three on the list is um, the efforts which the city has made to to help businesses. And I, I wanted to highlight uh, our business development efforts uh, in part because it's so important at this moment, and businesses uh, everywhere are are struggling. And uh, we've gone out of our way to, to try and provide assistance. We'll talk about some of the things that we've done. Um, we've got a terrific business development director, Mr. Jamal Jones, who's joining us now. And Jamal, I, I want to just talk a little bit about um, some of our business development efforts uh, over, the, over the past year and how they've uh, had, a, had a positive impact. Sure, Mayor. Thank you, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, we've really tried, as the mayor said, to uh, really do our best to uh, recognize uh, the impact that businesses have suffered uh, due to COVID-19. And in response to that, uh, really just make uh, you know, one just to be available and be responsive uh, and continue to create programming and create opportunities for businesses to uh, receive the assistance that they need. Uh, one way we've done that is through our business workshop series. Uh, throughout the year, we held quarterly workshops addressing topics such as branding and marketing, uh, establishing a presence online, and as I mentioned, managing the impact of, of COVID-19. Uh, we were uh, able to, you know, as I mentioned, really address, uh, you know, the needs of businesses. Uh, you know, even, uh, even though our, uh, we were unable to hold uh, sessions in person, we uh, transitioned onto an uh, online format. Uh, we were still able to average about 30 
uh, participants per session. So uh, you know, I do think that we were able to still you know, get the information out there that businesses needed about uh, how to start a business if they were in the early stages or, or really just how to maintain and uh, continue to, to thrive even despite the, uh, the difficult circumstances. Uh, another uh, project that we uh, offered was a uh, local spending campaign called Choose HBG. Uh, we had over 70 businesses participate uh, in a month-long uh, consumer awareness campaign that was really designed to direct more spending, uh, more investing, and more contracting to city-based businesses. Uh, you know, we had a, a wealth of different businesses uh, that were uh, participants in the program, from uh, our, our retail and restaurant community, uh, even to uh, our uh, art uh, art museums, uh, you know, theaters, uh, as well as uh, professional services like uh, you know marketing and, and graphic design. Uh, so again, we really just wanted to, uh, you know, direct as, as many of our uh, you know, residents to, to come out and, and support those businesses in the, in the time when they, when they needed it most. Uh, you know, one, a final effort uh, that I'll mention is, uh, and Moment shared a little bit about our, our business resources uh, page that was added to our, our, our larger uh, coronavirus uh, webpage. Uh, during those initial weeks of the uh, pandemic and the, the statewide shutdown, uh, a lot of businesses and business owners were uh, really kind of scrambling uh, to learn, you know, what resources were, were available. So what we did was compile a list uh, that contained uh, information about uh, financial assistance, uh, you know, employment opportunities, and also uh, safety tips to, to help businesses navigate the pandemic. Uh, also, what we did was uh, through uh, partnerships uh, in the community, we reached out just to find out, you know, which businesses uh, were not affected by the shutdown and were, were still open at that time to be able to provide you know, services to the, to the public. So we compiled a list of about 60 businesses uh, and posted those to our website so that uh, if individuals were looking for uh, takeout, uh, they could call those businesses and, and support them during that time. Uh, if they needed you know, other uh, important services uh, during those initial weeks of the, uh, the pandemic, you know, we were able to compile that list and put those businesses online. So you know, those were a few ways that, you know, we've, uh, you know, one, continued to support businesses, you know, through the pandemic, but overall, you know, just to, to make sure that we're, we're doing our very best to, you know, support business and support growth in the city of Harrisburg. Yeah, thank, thanks, Jamal, for that survey. All, all, all very much needed and uh, excellently uh, uh, executed uh, programs. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, another of the highlights of the of the past year, which was the Neighborhood Business Stabilization uh, Fund. We've we've had uh, two rounds of that so far. The the initial round early on in the pandemic um, uh, got grants out to uh, hundreds of businesses throughout the city that uh, were were basically um, were, were very much needed. They were they were straightforward grants the uh, the new round uh, and that was a partnership with impact Harrisburg and they they helped us uh, administer that program the new round a partnership with uh, Credic and the Harrisburg Regional Chamber um, uh, it seemed oversubscribed almost uh, immediately as it was launched and we've had uh, again hundreds of hundreds of inquiries there uh, that that program being a reimbursement grant to sort of help uh, uh, businesses get through the winter um, maybe maybe we will even need a a, a third round before this is uh, this is over, but they, they are examples of, uh, of, of really, I think, uh, ways in which the city is focused on helping its businesses, uh, uh, you know, uh, thrive and survive in some instances in the midst of uh, can, what can be challenging times. But um, it, why do you see the, the efforts of those uh, two uh, parts of the Neighborhood Business Stabilization Grant Fund uh, important? Well, sure. Though being able to provide businesses with some uh, financial assistance uh, obviously is of uh, high importance. Uh, many businesses have obviously day-to-day uh, -day operations that they need to continue. Uh, they have, you know, maybe creditors that uh, they need to pay, and you know, not, last but not least, uh, they have a dedicated workforce uh, that they need to be able to uh, to provide paychecks to. So, uh, you know, having uh, the city having an opportunity, uh, as you mentioned, in partnership with Impact Harrisburg and also uh, the second round in partnership with uh, Credic, uh, having that opportunity to, you know, provide some, you know, some hard uh, cash, you know, in, in those situations uh, or in, you know, in this case, uh, reimbursement for, for certain uh, uh, spending uh, is very important because, as I mentioned, it, it allows businesses to continue to do, you know, those, uh, those uh, actions and functions of their business that are are really vital to helping them 
uh, keep their doors open. Uh, I think another you know, reason that's very important is, uh, uh, you know, the national data is saying that, you know, uh, between February and, and April of, of this year, 22% uh, of, of small businesses, uh, you know, declined, you know, so uh, you know, when we look at, you know, how that you know, affects, you know, us locally, uh, you know, obviously you're going to continue to, to see a, a steep decline. Uh, but in addition to that, I think it's very important that, you know, we are in a position to help, you know, serve, you know, small and uh, diverse businesses. Uh, again, you know, data shows that, you know, our, our black owned, you know, minority owned businesses are, are going to be hit the hardest. 41% uh, of, of, of black owned businesses at this point, you know, are, are failing uh, with about 32% of uh, Latino owned businesses. So uh, again, you know, being in a position to provide, you know, some financial assistance to businesses that are uh, being affected the most, uh, I think is really important that we're able to provide a, a significant uh, level of support in, in offering some cash assistance. Yeah, th yeah, thanks for those stats. And uh, it, it, it's true, it's not just declining, but uh, it, you, you know, many, I, I'm sorry to say this, but many of the businesses that we we, we tried to stabilize in the first round of uh, that program are no longer with us. And uh, and cities around the country are seeing um, businesses uh, close up. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, you know, it, it's in many respects, it's a, it's a much better strategy to try and keep businesses open than it is to try and um, uh, get new businesses started or new businesses open uh, in the city. Those come with their own challenges. But I would say we're probably more in touch with the business community now, or at least your department is, uh, than, uh, than we were before the pandemic. In that sense, um, there's been lots of good interaction. We, we understand the needs and uh, we're, we're connected. I think we're poised as a city uh, for a very strong recovery. Um, I want to highlight one of the uh, highlights, I think, of the budget that uh, may be a little underreported, but uh, something which I know is near to your, and dear to your heart that we, we have funded for next year, which is a, uh, a, a sort of micro enterprise grant program for, for businesses. We talk a lot about um, helping established businesses survive, but now we also want to help entrepreneurs get started in the new year. And when we get to the other side of the coronavirus, which I know we will, um, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of demand. Maybe a lot of folks that thought uh, that maybe postponed opening a business or postponed getting started and uh, are, are, are going to be ready to go in the new year. You want to talk a little bit about that and what we may have in store? Sure. The microenterprise uh, grant program is a new initiative uh, coming in, in 2021. Uh, basically, we want to, you know, as you mentioned, you know, help those businesses that are uh, in those early stages uh, help get off the ground. Uh, you know, we recognize that, you know, many individuals have you know, certain ideas and, and, and talents that they, you know, maybe have uh, had for, for quite some time, but, you know, just maybe never, never thought it was the right time to start their business or, you know, maybe didn't have the resources. So, uh, you know, as a city and as a department, if we can, you know, help to, to foster that growth and, and help to provide, you know, uh, not only just, the, you know, the financial assistance, but, uh, you know, mentoring, uh, connection to you know, various resources uh, to help a business uh, get on its feet and uh, become part of our local economy. Uh, then you know that's you know really I think it's part of uh, part of our, our role and our responsibility as as local government to provide that that kind of assistance. So uh, for individuals who are uh, again maybe just you know single individuals, sole proprietors, you know, or uh, businesses that have a a, a small uh, small staff, uh, you know, we're really you know using a kind of a uh, a national uh, definition of a, of, of a small business uh, or a small enterprise. But, you know, for those, those businesses that are uh, interested, you know, we will be providing more information uh, in the future on how to uh, apply for that uh, micro enterprise grant, uh, because we are you know, really uh, excited about, uh, about that opportunity to provide, you know, small businesses with, uh, with that much needed assistance. Great. Well, thanks, Jamal. Something for businesses to look forward to, some positive news for uh, new things coming in 2021. So uh, thank you for being a highlight of the past year. And uh, 
Uh, we're moving to number two, and uh, we are pleased to have Mr. Blake Lynch with us because we're going to talk about community policing. Um, I want to, I want to, in a minute, preview a little bit more about uh, the big plans for for 2021. But 2020 was was quite a year for community policing in uh, in the city of Harrisburg, Blake. And um, uh, I think uh, you, you you probably uh, pushed yourself and uh, and uh, attempted uh, all sorts of new uh, methods of outreach that that maybe you never anticipated when you first became the community policing coordinator for the city of Harrisburg. So talk a little bit about what you feel um, have been the successes of the past year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for uh, having me on. Um, absolutely. It's been a pleasure to uh, join alongside with our officers to try and serve our community more, um, especially during the pandemic. We had a whole vision of uh, new and innovative things that we wanted to try this year. And a lot of that involved a uh, close connection with our residents and around the city. So we had to pivot and change things up uh, due to the pandemic. And in doing so, I think we actually made a greater impact uh, with our residents and uh, businesses as well. Um, so not just business checks and, um, and also working along church groups, but really uh, quality of life issues such as feeding our residents during this pandemic, connecting them to resources um, and agencies and organizations that can help them through this time uh, in, inside the uh, city government, what offices could help benefit them, um, as well as those with our school district. Um, our partnership there has been growing for a number of years and helping teachers connect with students, helping uh, caseworkers and probation officers connect with their students and, and others just to make sure that everyone is doing okay during this time. We've been able to facilitate a lot of that. So uh, we're truly grateful for that opportunity and uh, looking forward to doing more uh, next year. Um, you know, there's been a lot of things going on uh, right now. We're uh, operating a Coats for Kids drive. We are doing a food distribution giveaway. Uh, we're doing a toy distribution giveaway uh, all before Christmas. Uh, so we have about four things, four major events that we're trying to get done before the end of the year. Again, just to try and bring a sense of relief for our residents and around the city. Yeah, you've got a great a great team. And boy, those are some amazing uh, photos you're sharing, Moman. Uh, uh, inspiring. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you basically had to reinvent yourself, uh, do things a little bit differently, but uh, uh, as you say, perhaps uh, even more effectively. And um, we were so pleased by uh, by the impact that that uh, that you and your team were making. And we should mention the community uh, policing officer corps and Corporal Hammer, who was on last week. And uh, I think one of those pictures had uh, uh, Lieutenant Milo Hooper in it, who will be the new captain of our uh, community services division in the new year just approved in the budget. Um, but we've got a great team, and we wanted to expand that team and expand the team's influence. And we have created um, and uh, put under your direction a, 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 a new um, civilian uh, team of uh, community service aides for, for the new year that are going to represent each of the districts, uh, policing districts of the city, each of the neighborhoods. Um, we're currently putting together a, a task force, uh, uh, which will include uh, city council to help get the word out about these positions and to help us uh, advertise and hire great people. But let's give a little preview of, um, of, uh, of this, uh, this community service age position and, and how people um, uh, uh, you know, may, may, may want to apply and learn more about it. Sure. Well, once uh, everything gets up and running uh, on our side through uh, through the budget process, which has been approved, but official next year, uh, we will start the hiring process and really the promotion process of uh, allowing residents and others uh, to apply for the opportunity to join our team. Uh, we have been very busy uh, in and around the community, not just, well, our officers, not just uh, responding to calls and doing those things, but also on the other side of uh, serving our residents and this community policing effort, which has been uh, very successful. Um, there are a lot of things that we don't promote um, that have been happening, such as uh, individuals doing safe surrenders and calling us, calling myself, calling Corporal Hammer to turn themselves in. They feel safe because of the relationships that we have built with others in the community and networks, um, as well as helping them uh, have off offline meetings with officers you know, to discuss charges and how they can become better, um, meetings with judges. There, there's, there's a lot of things that we don't promote, 
but are part of the community policing strategy, which is all about building relationships. And in doing so, when things arise, help us to solve crimes and help our officers to achieve more. So uh, we're really grateful for that opportunity uh, to continue to build on that. When it goes to community service aides that we're going to be hiring, we're going to be looking for people who are uh, passionate about our community, passionate about the city residents, and advocating for much more uh, to try and make sure quality of life issues are addressed. And when I say quality of life issues, I'm talking things that are normally lower priority calls uh, that our officers do get the chance to respond to, but maybe not in the nature um, because the city is so diverse with the number of calls that it receives. Uh, we may, uh, officers may receive, you know, a homicide call or overdose or many other things, and you still have those quality of life issues that residents are waiting for, which are important to them. Um, but as the officers are being dispatched, they're not able to meet the needs as fast, such as uh, an illegal dumping uh, or, you know, a loud music call or, um, you know, um, a runaway, missing juvenile, or you know, a dog barking. There, there's many things. Um, someone broke my window, uh, and they just need a report. There's a lot of things that affect our, our residents every day that perhaps a civilian could assist with, that are in a um, in a fashion that would actually help our officers to allow them to do more serious police work during those high times, uh, and that's what we're going to be looking for. And in addition to also. Uh, building those relationships with the community, such as attending neighborhood uh, watch group meetings, helping organize neighborhood watches, uh, assisting and directing people to the appropriate uh, departments inside of the city. Um, I mean, I, I receive calls for how can people get help paying their Comcast bill. I mean, those are things that our officers receive from our non-emergency phone number, um, you know, or how to pay a fine or what agency do you need to go to to do this. And uh, a lot of civilians can help with that to make sure that our residents uh, know where to go and are aided better um, to go along their way. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I, I do think one of the great accomplishments uh, of the year was uh, was the the approval of the budget and the uh, the development of this new uh, community services division, and the affirmation by council of uh, of a vision which is which is definitely neighborhood focused and uh, civilian focused. Uh, we we talked about the community service aides, but there's also going to be a, a new crime analyst that'll be part of your division that can help um, work with neighborhood groups to get them the information that they need. There's uh, new uh, new partnerships uh, with uh, uh, neighborhood organizations that are, are being funded. There's also um, a new emphasis on the technical services and the reporting side of things. There's a record uh, services manager. There's a technical services manager. There are other new positions that are going to help um, uh, help get the data which uh, the public wants to see and neighborhoods want to see um, from the systems into into usable forms. And so it, it's ex it's really exciting to me just the the growth of capacity, the ability to do more, um, the ability to do more on a on a on a really local neighborhood or district by district level. What, what excites you the most, uh, Blake, about the possibilities uh, here for 2021? I, I'm really excited, Mr. Mayor, for more people um, who are passionate to serve our residents. Uh, it, is, it is challenging to uh, have it all on Corporal Hammer and myself. So expanding the team uh, so that we can actually do more, reach more people is extremely exciting for me. So I'm excited about that, getting the hiring process going, getting these interviews going, and then having people on the streets representing uh, their individual uh, assigned areas of the city to double down and build stronger, deeper relationships with the residents and the organizations and the churches uh, and the businesses uh, in those areas so that they can feel that they're heard. And then those things are then reflected back to us as a bureau, but then also uh, to you, uh, Mr. Mayor, as well, so you understand what's going on uh, at that level as well. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Blake. That a true, true highlight of the year, and a lot of excitement uh, to look forward to uh, to come in 2021. We're going to turn now a moment to our number one, our number one uh, issue and accomplishment that we are most proud of for uh, for 2020, and uh, and this is actually something which I don't think has gotten uh, the attention or the coverage in the media which uh, which it deserves, and that is that very very much at the end of the year we introduced a whole series of uh, new bills that will fundamentally um, define and um, uh, incentivize and change the city's approach to affordable housing and housing development. Development. 
Um, council will take those up in the new year, but they were uh, en um, uh, entered into the record this year and leading the charge for more affordable housing and better affordable housing in the city of Harrisburg has been our new economic development director, uh, Ms. Nona Watson, who joins us now. Nona, um, uh, affordable housing. Let's let's start with, um, with just a little overview from your perspective. And this is one of the things I tasked you with when we uh, when we brought you aboard as economic development director, uh, your your sort of um, overview of of the current um, housing crisis and the current needs uh, in Harrisburg for affordable housing. And welcome. Hello, Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, we are definitely in an affordable housing crisis, and it's not. We've been in this crisis. Um, but now it, it has just been taken to another level because, of course, we are experiencing um, the pandemic. So now we're in this, this health crisis, this financial crisis. And, um, but people are really struggling to make ends meet. They are stressing because of fear of evictions, um, because of the increase in rents. And in reference to uh, unemployment, Mayor, uh, this month, 853,000 claims were filed um, in the U.S. That's an increase of 137,000 from the previous week. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, the data on homelessness for 2020, it will be published in January 2021, but we already know it is it, it has increased. However, in, in 2019, 567,000 individuals were homeless in the United States of which 13,199 in Pennsylvania and 418 in the city of Harrisburg and Dauphin County combined. Also, many households um, are spending more than 40% of their household income on housing costs. And so, you know, we consider that um, cost burden and um, many cannot find affordable housing. So Mayor, we knew that we needed to, to really get on it. We needed to be able to encourage and promote affordable housing um, right here in Harrisburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as we look at the, uh, the landscape right before the uh, coronavirus crisis hit, uh, you were seeing the completion of uh, a, a number of very, very prominent and uh, impressive uh, affordable housing projects. Uh, you see, you see what happened in Mulder Square. Uh, you, you, you look uptown to what happened with the Veterans uh, Housing Project near the Hub, or um, you, you look uh, down Paxton Street for the senior housing that have been put in place. There, there have been a there have been a number of success stories. However, um, uh, and there are more to come. And I know the city has uh, is supporting, for instance. Uh, um, with uh, federal dollars, a, a major uh, transformative affordable housing project for Central Allison Hill and another for the Jackson Square uh, area of Midtown. Um, but, uh, but we thought it was you know, important to, to try and incentivize even more. And um, let's talk specifically about some of the bills that, uh, that were introduced uh, just this uh, past month uh, to try and, and do exactly that. Can you walk us through uh, some of those efforts, Nona? Uh, some of the bills? Yeah. Yeah. OK, sure. OK, so um, we were we have introduced to council um, zoning code amendments um, and Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We've introduced the council um, zoning code amendments, and that included um, density bonuses. And, and what that is, is if developers agree to include like 20% or more affordable housing units in their development project, um, then they can take advantage of density bonuses, which will allow them to actually create more um, more units and and um, make the project or the development more affordable. Um, we also um, included zoning districts because uh, of of course you know there are some zoning districts that did not allow for certain uses. Um, so we extended that that we can have other type of 
um, housing developments in other um, zoning districts because we know we want people to know that and that they can live wherever they want to live in the city and that there is affordable housing in in all the zoning districts. Um, also, we introduce we introduce uh, to council a tax incentive, which is through the um, uh, local economic revitalization tax assistance program. We call that LERDA. So it is to actually ease um, um, some of the conditions for that program so that we can actually get more affordable housing. And then the uh, street vacation process, which is to formalize um, that particular process for the development of affordable housing. So those were the three main um, bills that we introduced to them. And all of this is part of the affordable housing program. Yeah, and uh, and just to flesh it out even a bit more, uh, you know, we, we, we defined what affordable housing is, uh, what it means. We gave, uh, uh, we, we not only uh, created definitions in the law, but we have created um, a certification process, a certification process by which you will, um, you will, uh, you know, if, if it meets the right criteria as, um, as uh, enumerated in the law, you'll be able to certify various projects as affordable, uh, affordable housing projects, which then will qualify for these uh, these types of incentives and as you rightly mentioned um, we want these incentives to be citywide uh, not uh, not in just one area of the city because we want to see affordable housing everywhere the needs clearly show um, uh, the need uh, and and uh, the, the only way we're going to be able to do this successfully is to have partners uh, with uh, in the in the in the private sector and with with developers and I know one of the things that you've done is you've um, you've done a lot of outreach you've worked with a lot of people that are currently building projects uh, or want to uh, look at building projects in the city we've seen a real uptick uh, believe it or not in terms of interest in in housing development Part of that is because of the uh, of the current climate with interest rates and uh, uh, and uh, with more people telecommuting. I think people are looking at uh, you know living in places like Harrisburg, where the cost of living isn't as high as in major uh, uh, other metropolitan areas. So um, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of new construction of housing, and so the question is, how can we ensure? That um, people will be able to afford to live in 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 those uh, in 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 those new newly established uh, buildings, and um, uh, you know, and we we're concluding that the best way uh, to do that is to incentivize developers to include a portion of affordable housing in what they're doing. Um, so a lot to look forward to in the new year. I, I, again, a topic which uh, I think has really uh, come out of the of the current crisis. It's it's made us stronger. It has helped uh, unite us in terms of uh, what the what the goals and needs of the community are. Uh, Nona, do you, do you have any uh, concluding thoughts you'd like to leave us with on on, on affordable housing? Uh, one of the things that I just wanted to say is, um, you know, this is a. a top priority for, it should be for all of us, Mayor. It definitely is with the administration and it is with uh, city council. I want to say that uh, we have met with members of city council who have weighed in on um, uh, the affordable housing program. Uh, we have listened to our residents. Um, we have done the research and, and the planning. We have tapped into our, our planning department who have provided us um, their expertise to kind of guide us along the way. And as you stated, I've met with uh, different developers who um, came in and they shared, you know, what they thought would help um, to help us to be able to actually um, build uh, affordable housing in the city. And my question to each one of them, one of the questions that I had for each one of them was, you know, do you think that what we are proposing is going to make a difference? And, and if not, you know, what else can we do? So we received feedback. I met with maybe 14 members of the development community and they gave us some great feedback. They are all excited that, you know, this is on our radar because we know that there are so many things, you know, in, in development that, you know, it, are barriers to actually providing affordable housing. So, and they share some of those things with us. So we think that we're on a great 
on, the, on a great path. And um, one of the things that I just want the viewing um, audience to know is it doesn't stop with what we have proposed already. We are going to continue to do the research. We've done the research to find out what they're doing in other municipalities. And we're going to continue to find out what will work here in the city of Harrisburg. Because at the end of the day, we want to provide affordable housing for all incomes and we want them to be able to live you know wherever they want to live in the city and we want to address those issues that keep coming up not just here in harrisburg but just all throughout the the uh united states those those buzzwords like segregation and poverty and gentrification and all of those words that in order for us to really get to the place that we need to be as a city that we have to have these mixed incomes mixed um mixed incomes mixed developments uh um and mixed housing you know so that's very very important and i think mayor we are well on our way to that Thank you. Thank you, Nona. And I think uh, one of the themes of today is that sometimes out of great challenge and adversity and even crisis um, it can come uh, many, many positive things, it can come bold ideas and um, uh, uh, community cohesion and uh, people thinking about things in, in new ways. So you have you have a tragedy of uh, of uh, of a uh, you know an accident on State Street that leads to a bold new vision for the city. You have um, uh, you have people rallying and 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 working for um, uh, to proclaim that Black Lives Matter, and uh, you have a bold new vision for community policing. You have um, a health epidemic and crisis that allows our communication department to. Um, uh, create new means of, of reaching the public, and you have a, a, a crisis which puts pressures on businesses, but allows us to um, to identify their needs and work together and help support them in ways we've never seen before. And we clearly have a housing crisis, but out of that is going to come new approaches and new ways of us working together to address the affordable housing needs of us all. So 2020 has been quite a year, but um, we've, it's also brought us together and, and encouraged us to think about things in, in new ways. Um, and with that moment, I will turn it to you for maybe a little public comment. We have a, a few folks. Yes, yes, we have a few questions. I think we have a time for maybe one or two. And whatever we don't get to, we invite the public to call 311 or to submit a sport ticket. Um, I could probably use that as an opportunity to give them a shout out as well. Yes. 311 team has been doing great. Um, Todd and Antoine at the front desk uh, throughout the year um, uh, for our support tickets and, and 311 calls, 8 to 5, Monday to Friday. Yeah. Um, the first question we have, um, th there's two questions, I'll roll those into one. This is from Joyce. Why is the concentration of COVID-19 so high in the city? Is there enough testing? And do we have any statistics about deaths? All right. Um, uh, why is the concentration of COVID-19 uh, so high in the city is, a, is an excellent question. Um, I, I, when you look at the charts and you see that um, our concentration levels are so much worse than, than hundreds of other municipalities that are tested, it, um, uh, it, it really makes you, uh, it makes you wonder and ponder that question. And I have. Um, I, I'm not sure I have all, all the answers. Uh, I think it has to do um, certainly with issues of uh, poverty. It has to do with um, uh, the the density of Harrisburg, the housing stock of Harrisburg, um, uh, the uh, you know the the mobility of people and communities, and and how easy this virus is to spread. Um, but that's definitely a question that deserves uh, additional. Uh, you know, research. I think uh, what we need to do uh, now is just to con continue to, um, uh, you know, send the message clearly that we are in the middle of uh, of, of a spike. We're in the middle of a uh, a new wave, and we've got to be careful, and we've got to take it seriously. Um, and there is such a divide too. You go across the river, and um, you know, I see everybody out uh, Christmas shopping, and you know, going uh, and and for, uh, sort of behaving as if things are normal, and 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 they're not normal. And the data shows that they're not normal. And a graph like that just means that we have to we have to take things seriously with regard to testing. No, we don't have enough testing in the city. There's no question about that. Um, this this, as I've said before, really has to do with a real failure on the federal level to invest in testing early. Um, if we had put a focus on this nationally and developed uh, opportunities for testing, we'd be, uh, we'd be in a much better uh, shape now. 
Um, and uh, now I think our focus is moving from testing to vaccine distribution. And I think with uh, with new federal leadership, that's going to be that's going to be handled better than perhaps um, the initial wave of, of, of testing was. We have been fortunate in Harrisburg to have um, some access to free testing through through Hamilton Health and uh, and UPMC Pinnacle has had a testing center which has been working at capacity in the city of Harrisburg at Paxton and Cameron constantly throughout the crisis. But um, we haven't been able to do the widespread testing. Nobody has been able to do the widespread testing um, in part because as a society we didn't invest in it. But just some reflections at the end of the year a moment good questions from Joyce mm -hmm. and I think that's all the time for questions we have but uh, we can uh, just uh, two quick comments here we have a, a heart emoji from Levette who's enjoying the show and um, Joyce who's uh, Joyce Davis here uh, is saying uh, congratulations to the communication so we appreciate uh, her comment as well so oh, well that uh, especially nice coming from Joyce uh, 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 given the uh, uh, she uh, uh, left left you and uh, went went on to to Penn Live, but uh, continues to watch from uh, um, from afar. So thanks, Joyce, and thanks for all your communications and all your efforts as well. Penn Live's been out there um, uh, doing a lot of good reporting and and making access to those stories free uh, during the crisis, and we appreciate that. So uh, with that, we will say goodbye to 2020. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been uh, it's been quite a year. We will be back in the new year with. Uh, uh, new community conversations. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, important topics. Uh, many of the things we discussed uh, are going to be rolling over into the new year. We'll, we'll continue to discuss those community service aids. We'll talk about the affordable housing. We will talk about some other topics uh, as uh, we begin to debate them in the new year. Uh, I know City Council has a um, comprehensive plan. They want to uh, they want to affirm in the new year, and they're looking to schedule meetings and, and discussions, and we'll have that conversation here, too. So uh, until then, however, this is Mayor Eric Papenfu saying I hope you all have a, a, a happy, a safe, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and positive uh, holiday um, uh, season with, uh, with your families. I hope everybody will, will, will take it slow, spend some quality time. And, uh, and, and, and above all else, uh, truly stay safe. So until, until 2021, um, thank you. Thank you for watching. And we will see you next year on Fridays at noon at Community Conversations.